You know what really gets me excited? Building software. Build, building lots of software. Building gigabytes of software. Using terabytes of disk space. It's just chewing up so much space. If you've been following the channel for a while, you know that building open embedded is one of the things that we like to do to really see how a workstation is gonna work for software development performance. I should preface that by saying, you know, a six core, a fast six core with a good disc and lots of memory is a perfectly reasonable developer workstation. But if you get into using Vagrant or Ansible and virtual machines and doing a build or doing simulation, like simulating a lot of mobile devices and running through automated testing, then you can need more horsepower. On the level one forums, one of the use cases that comes up a lot is having a build server. So each you know, member of the team might have a pretty reasonable workstation, like a six or eight or a 12 core, a desktop class machine. And then there might be a build server uh, that is maybe the lead developer's workstation or that's maybe on a server or something. So you could have a server, but for the last year or so, having a threader per workstation has been more popular. Well, Intel's just released the 6258R CPUs, and uh, I've got this box workstation on loan from Intel. So I thought, hey, let's see how the dual 6258R would work as a workstation, because this is this chassis is configured more as workstation than server. It's got a workstation, it's mo motherboard, it's got built-in audio. It does have a 1600 watt power supply and two 28 core CPUs. So we're talking about 56 threads. How does it work for open embedded? Oh, and just for good measure, we're gonna also throw in Path of Titans again. Yeah, so all right, mini plug for Path of Titans. They uh, they let me loose in their code base. I have I, I, I have root access. No, not really, I don't have root access, but it's a lot of fun. I like working on real world projects and someday I'll get to share some more real world projects, but uh, I digress. So the 6258R, it's got some serious advantages. I mean, it's two sockets, which means we have two sets of six channel memory. So off the bat, it is configured for tons and tons of memory bandwidth. Now this particular motherboard has eight slots per socket. And if you actually populate all eight of those slots, the memory bandwidth isn't what it should be because you've got two DIMMs per channel in one of the channels. So if you run memory benchmarks, the performance is not where it should be. So the optimal configuration for memory bandwidth for those CPUs is to run six sticks of memory per socket. You can get away with four. Four is not too much of a, of a performance uh, problem. But I've noticed that if you order these systems from Dell or HP and you don't get an insane amount of memory, like 128, 256, 512 gigs of memory, uh, they have a tendency to stick in a non-optimal number of DIMMs. If you order a system like this with 32 or 64 gigabytes of memory, don't be surprised if that comes on just two DIMMs, one DIMM per socket. And that is definitely not an optimal memory bandwidth situation. At least if you're trying to recreate this and you know, do that kind of thing. I think four DIMMs per socket, eight DIMMs total, that would also be okay because that'll run in quad channel instead of six channel. But uh, it's not an optimal configuration to run eight sticks of memory because one of the channels has two DIMMs and it just doesn't seem to balance the load correctly, at least on Linux. That said, the performance of the 6258R CPUs is breathtaking. It is an incredible, incredible workstation. And it kind of makes sense. I mean, these CPUs have the same performance characteristic of the Platinum 8180s. Those CPUs were $10,000 less than a year ago. And these CPUs are about $4,000 per socket. If you want to dive into the nitty gritty, of the open embedded performance because there's really a lot to talk about and there's a lot of different ways that you can build open embedded, check out my GitHub link below. You can actually clone the project and build open embedded on your system. Most higher end systems can do all of the open embedded building in about two to three hours, give or take. This system can do it in 45 minutes if you do some hand tuning and jump through some hoops and, and, and go, go through some stuff that way. The really surprising thing, and it really isn't surprising in retrospect, but the thing that I was surprised by is when you're doing an open embedded build, um, the system remains pretty responsive. So in the build server scenario, say you're running you know, GitLab or GitHub or something like that, and you've got a small Kubernetes instance running on this, and so your developers are doing stuff and there's smaller repos without having to do you know, a full rebuild, 
and they're kicking off jobs from their Git repo to do simulation or testing or something like that. This system handles that really well. It's sort of a mixed workload. I noticed that, you know, when we were doing our last video, which was on the 64 core Threadripper, I noticed that when you had a bunch of mixed workloads, especially with the 32 core Threadripper and to a lesser extent the 64 core Threadripper, that it would thrash a little bit more. And I attributed some of that to um, not enough memory because the Threadripper platform is capped at 256 gigabytes of memory. This we can run, you know, one and a half, well, 768 gigabytes, one and a half terabytes, I guess, give or take, before we get into Optane territory. And that does, you know, work really well for caching and that kind of thing. Strictly speaking, you want out of memory uh, with 256 gigabytes of memory, um, but your room for juggling things, I mean, that's sort of right at the limit. Of course, you, you could upgrade you know, to Epic on the AMD side because there is an argument to be made in terms of price, but the price adjustment from Intel, I mean, that's kind of what I see these 6258R processors as, is kind of sort of a price adjustment. Now, the Platinum CPUs, you can work in like a quad socket motherboard, and they've got some other features these gold 6258R uh, processors don't have, but in terms of any kind of real world computational performance scenario, that's basically the same CPU, or close to it. It's just the whole number of sockets and a couple other uh, enterprise features. So you can check that out the differences on Intel Arc for uh, more differences, but overall it's not too bad. If you do find yourself running into uh, memory limitations, but only every now and then, might I suggest Optane. Just for giggles, I also did some testing on this platform with the Optane DC P 4800X series. These are 375 gigabytes each. So, you know, dropping in another 640 gigabytes of memory. 640 gigabytes ought to be enough for anybody, right? I mean, that's, that's where we've come, 640 gigabytes of, of memory. The deal with Optane is that the latency of Optane is about uh, twice as much as main memory. Yeah, the bandwidth is nowhere near main memory, especially when we're talking about quad or hex channel uh, configuration and multiple sockets. But uh, it turns out the memory access pattern really isn't you know, super bandwidth dependent when you're doing, it depends on the type of compile you're doing, but if you're doing a heavy compile, it's gonna spend a lot of time in compute versus memory access, so it's not that much of a penalty, but it depends on what you're doing. Um, the other thing is that with a two socket configuration, there is another penalty, and that's sort of inter-process communication. Anything that has to go across sockets to communicate is not gonna run as well as stuff that can stay inside a single socket. Now, fortunately for Anything that a developer might be doing, except perhaps simulation, um, it doesn't matter. Like the whole dual socket, single socket thing, the performance is, is basically completely fine, single socket versus dual socket. And also the other server video that I did on the dual 18 core, you know, moving from uh, dual 18 core to 28 cores, the 28 cores performance is pretty close to dual 18 cores and because you lose a little bit of overhead and inter intercommunication except for when you're doing jobs like rendering and compiling because you could I mean you can do distributed compiles across physical machines and you don't really get much of a penalty and you, you can imagine that the latency between physical machines is way worse than the latency between sockets and the latency between sockets is way worse than the latency between you know cores that are on the same package or cores that are that are in the same you know, general neighborhood that are right next to each other on a package, not necessarily the same piece of silicon. But overall, the performance of this box workstation is insane. So I gotta send this thing back. That's about all I've got to test with it uh, at this point. We also did some machine learning benchmarks using the Tesla V100 and also some SRIOV work with the S7150. Be sure to check out those videos. This is a ridiculous amount of, uh, of, of horsepower. It's a little bit like, you know, somebody loaning you a Stradivarius violin and it's like, oh, I can see. Yes, the Stradivarius violin, this is amazing. But it's cool, I'm sending it back, it's all good. With the pricing of this system at about, you know, it's $4,000 per CPU and then there's thousands of dollars more in the rest of the system, but the price is dominated by the price of the CPU and the number of CPUs that you have. You know, from, from $10,000 to $4,000, is quite a performance improvement. I mean, the 6258R, there really wasn't an equivalent CPU last generation, except for maybe the Platinum 8180. So the fact that those CPUs are only $4,000 is really pretty good for a workstation and a platform that is as tried and true as Xeon. Depending on what you're doing, your uh, work or your hardware or whatever may only be qualified for Xeon. That said, the performance of Threadripper is pretty good. If you look at the open embedded 
benchmarks and some of the stuff that's there. There's a workstation version of Threadripper and an AMD Epic on the server side. These are strictly speaking server CPUs in a workstation configuration. Strictly speaking, Threadripper CPUs are not really a workstation CPU because of the whole memory limitation and error correction. Error correction is, is kind of up to the motherboard vendor to be qualified but sometimes error correction is not working correctly, even though it is actually reported as working correctly. Like you might get single bit error correction working correctly, but it's not actually reported to the OS correctly because the modules are missing on the AMD platform. Uh, that's not true on Epic. I mean, on the Epic CPUs, the, the whole stack is fully qualified, but AMD sort of left it up to motherboard vendors to, to do the ECC thing themselves. And I, I, my personal opinion of that is that uh, they're gonna have to rein that in pretty soon. Uh, Intel Xeon, on the other hand, uh, yeah, it's fully good to go. You don't even have to worry about it. This thing is already using uh, registered error correcting memory. So you've got higher memory capacity and more memory bandwidth than Threadripper, although less memory bandwidth than Epic. But you can see in the performance numbers that it's actually quite good. So as a build server, especially something that's running mixed use where you're running maybe a big build job and then little build jobs um, that are connected to, you know, actions that are happening on GitHub or actions that are happening, uh, you know, in GitLab or something like that. This is a really solid solution for that because you can juggle a lot of stuff. And the memory situation means that even if you need to spin up a hundred virtual machines, you're able to add as much memory as you need to the platform, which is the only real place that I ran into a problem with uh, the 256 gig memory limit on Threadripper is spinning up a lot of real virtual machines. Containers was no problem. Uh, hitting swap, you know, using Optane as swap on Threadripper, that was completely an option. But check out the GitHub link and check out the build performance and all that because, you know, even despite the higher cost, there is a benefit from paying the higher cost of the workstation. It's up to you and your specific use case and your specific workload to determine if that matters for you because, you know, it, you do, you do, get a little bit more of some other things depending on what you pay for. But, you know, the raw performance, if you're just after a couple of things, you're just cherry picking a few different things in terms of performance, uh, you can save some money in other ways by either not getting a platform that's quite as expensive from Team Blue or, you know, from competitors. It just depends, it depends on what you're doing. The Box.com Apex 4, dual Xeon 6258R, 56 cores of pure, unadulterated madness. Box has really done a good job putting this Apex workstation together. It's really well built. Uh, we reviewed it separately if you wanna check that out, but I've been uh, basically running it full tilt, like melt the electrical sockets full tilt, and it's held up like a champ. I've only rebooted it, I think, twice? Yeah, like two, three times maybe, three times maybe. And uh, it has, handled literally everything that I've thrown at it in terms of doing build jobs, Kubernetes, web simulation, even running macOS virtual machines, simulating iOS to do, uh, you know, like web project automation, like let's fully automate testing this website, clicking through it, and then taking screenshots and seeing what changed from this build to that build, which can be kind of computationally intensive because you got to render things graphically. You can't just do that with a headless Chrome instance. Well, I mean, you can, but the Apple aspect of that makes it weird. And this thing handled it like a champ. I mean, like a champ. Our disk storage system in this is a four-way NVMe RAID from Kioxia. So I did some videos on Kioxia's uh, NVMe stuff. You should check that out. And some also some off-label use cases. But this is a pretty bog standard, you know, uh, 80 millimeter M.2 four-way uh, RAID 0 because it's a build server. And, you know, it's not actually storing the repos or anything like that. It's just doing testing. So re-imaging it if something goes wrong is not really a big deal. We also experimented with adding Optane for cache and also swap. So, you know, what's the performance like if you're memory constrained and on other platforms, like we're trying to do apples to apples comparison with say like Threadripper, uh, uh, where it's got the 256 gig me memory, 256 gig memory limit. It's uh, makes sense to me to use Optane as a swap device. So when you run out of memory, uh, you at least get the latency benefit. You don't have the bandwidth, but you at least get the, the latency benefit of Optane for using it as a swap device. If you develop games and you gotta juggle iOS and Android and Xbox and PC and the demo version and everything else, a lot of CPU horsepower really helps a lot. 
a lot. If you're doing cross-platform development, something like Open Embedded, you're gonna run Linux on your toaster and your PC and your you know smart oven and your other thing and your, your smart TV and every appliance under the sun and your developers making changes constantly, being able to run through and test all of that stuff simultaneously is pretty handy. You, it, it doesn't really take millions of dollars of compute to do that anymore. You can do it on relatively commodity desktop systems. Exciting times. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1, I'm signing out, and I'll see you later. Be sure to check out that GitHub repo, build it, you know, with your system and, and see what it posts. There's gonna be somebody in the comments that's like, I built it on my Ryzen 5 3400G in 43 hours. <laughs> you can turn hours into minutes with these powerful workstations. That's sort of exciting. All right, I'm Wendell, this is Level 1, I'm signing out, and I'll see you later.